prompt assessment and subsequent control of the airway, maintaining its patency and providing ventilation if required is an essential part of advanced life support skills. The prevention of secondary damage to the brain and other vital organs from hypoxia is a priority. Without adequate oxygenation, it may be impossible to restore an organized and perfusing cardiac rhythm. The objective of this presentation is to detail the various techniques used in adult advanced life support regarding airway management. This will follow the Australian and New Zealand Resuscitation Council guidelines released at the end of December 2010. The basic techniques used to relieve upper airway obstruction should be followed by practitioners of advanced life support as the most common cause of ineffective ventilation during resuscitation is the failure to maintain either the head tilt chin lift or the jaw thrust maneuvers. In assessing the airway, the mouth should be opened and turned to one side to allow drainage of any fluids that may be present. Only visible obstruction should be removed by the rescuer and under no circumstances should the rescuer attempt to remove obstructions they cannot see by performing a blind finger sweep as this may further aggravate the compromised airway by pushing an obstruction further back or stimulating a residual gag reflex. Ideally, the application of suction for a wide bore catheter should be used with care to maintain the catheter patency by removing large chunks of any vomit. All unconscious victims should be handled gently with no twisting or bending of the spinal column and the neck. If it is necessary, move the head gently to obtain a clear airway. If a spinal injury is suspected, maintain the head, neck, chest and lumbar region in the neutral position during resuscitation. Excessive head tilt could aggravate the injury and damage the cervical spinal cord. This complication remains theoretical though and the relative risk is unknown. When there is a risk of cervical spine injury, establish a clear airway using the jaw thrust or chin lift in combination with manual inline stabilization of the head and neck by an assistant. If life-threatening airway obstruction persists despite effective application of the jaw thrust or chin lift, gently add head tilt a small amount at a time until the airway is open. The establishing of a patent airway takes priority over concerns about potential cervical spine injury. In unresponsive adults, it is reasonable to open the airway using the head tilt, chin lift maneuver. To perform this, one hand is placed on the forehead or on top of the head. The other hand is used to provide the chin lift. The head, not the neck, is tilted backwards. It is important to avoid using excessive force, especially when a neck injury is suspected. The chin lift is performed by holding the chin using the thumb and fingers to pull the chin upwards and open the mouth. This action moves the tongue and soft tissues away from the back of the throat. The jaw thrust is an alternative manoeuvre to the head tilt chin lift. Using this technique, the mandible is brought forward relieving obstruction that be, can be caused by the soft palate and epiglottis. To perform the jaw thrust, the rescuer should place their index to little finger behind the angle of the mandible. Upward pressure is then applied to move the jaw upwards and forwards. Using the thumbs, the mouth is opened slightly by a downward displacement of the chin. The jaw thrust is the preferred option for a victim with suspected or actual cervical spine fracture. The use of the oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airways should be limited to those who have had training in using them. An oropharyngeal or Goodell airway is a curved plastic tube which is flanged and reinforced at the oral end with a flattened shape to ensure that it fits neatly between the tongue and the hard palate. It is not suitable for use in the semi-conscious person as it may stimulate the gag reflex and cause vomiting. A nasopharyngeal airway is made from soft, malleable plastic, beveled at one end and a flange at the other. In patients who are not deeply unconscious, it is tolerated better than an oropharyngeal airway. Incorrect use of either of these devices can further compromise a victim's airway. The oropharyngeal airway 
is available in sizes suitable for small and large adults. The most common sizes are 2, 3 and 4, which are small, medium and large respectively. A perfect fit is not always possible. In this case, an oropharyngeal that is slightly too big will be more beneficial than one that is slightly too small. An estimate of the size required may be obtained by selecting an airway with a length corresponding to the vertical distance between the patient's incisors and the angle of the jaw, as shown here. To insert the oropharyngeal airway, open the victim's mouth and ensure that there is no foreign material that potentially could be pushed back into the larynx. If there is, remove it before attempting any insertion. Insert the airway into the mouth in the upside down position as far as the junction between the hard and soft palate and then rotate it through 180 degrees. Continue to advance the airway until it lies within the pharynx. This rotation technique minimizes the chances of pushing the tongue backwards and downwards. Correct placement is indicated by an improvement in airway patency. Complications of oropharyngeal airway insertion include the tongue being pushed backwards, exacerbating obstruction instead of relieving it. Also, you should be aware that the oropharyngeal airway may lodge in the vacuola or epiglottis and obstruct the lumen. Nasopharyngeal tubes are sized in millimetres according to their internal diameter, with the length increasing in accordance with the diameter. Sizes 6 to 7 millimetres are suitable for most adults. Inadvertent insertion of a nasopharyngeal airway through a base of skull fracture and into the cranial vault is possible, but extremely rare. In the presence of a known or suspected basal skull fracture, an oral airway is preferred. To insert a nasopharyngeal airway, check the patency of the right nostril. Some packaging of nasopharyngeal airways supply a safety pin that needs to be inserted into the flange prior to insertion. This is designed to prevent the airway disappearing behind, beyond the nares. Lubricate the airway thoroughly using water-soluble jelly. Insert the bevel end first, vertically along the floor of the nose with a slight twisting action. If any obstruction is met, Remove the tube and try the left nostril. Once the airway is in place, use a look, listen and feel technique to check the patency of the airway and adequacy on ventilation. A jaw thrust or chin lift may be required to maintain the airway patency. An adequate facial seal around the mouth and nose is essential for effective ventilation using a pocket mask, concord mask and bag mask valve to deliver breaths. If you are using a mask during resuscitation, if able, position yourself at the victim's head. Use both hands to hold the mask in place and open the airway using the head tilt or jaw thrust maneuver. Deliver the breath with enough volume and force to observe the chest rise, then remove your mouse from the mask to allow exhalation. If the chest does not rise, recheck the head tilt, chin lift or jaw thrust position and the mask seal. As mentioned earlier, failure to maintain the head tilt, chin lift or the jaw thrust is the most common cause of obstruction during resuscitation. You should aim to give each breath over one second, allowing the chest to fully recoil before the next breath is given. Rescue breathing has an oxygen concentration of 16%. In the absence of data indicating the optimal saturation of arterial oxygenation during CPR, if able, ventilate the lungs with 100% oxygen until the return of spontaneous circulation. After the return of spontaneous circulation, peripheral readings of saturations are far more reliable and oxygen can be titrated with confidence. There is some data indicating an association between hyperoxemia after the return of spontaneous circulation and worse outcomes. When blood oxygenation saturation levels can be measured reliably, peripheral saturation should be maintained with that 94 to 98% or 88 to 92% if the patient has COPD. 
The self-inflating bag can be connected to a face mask, tracheal tube or supraglottic airway device. On squeezing the bag, its contents are delivered to the patient and on expiration diverted to the atmosphere. The bag then refills automatically. If the self-inflated bag is not connected to an oxygen supply, the percentage delivered will be at 21%. When high flow oxygen is connected directly to the self-inflating bag without an oxygen reservoir attached, oxygen percentage rises to 45%. An inspired oxygen concentration of approximately 85% is achieved if a reservoir system is attached and the oxygen is delivered at a maximum rate. Ensure that the reservoir bag expands when oxygen is attached and the integrity of the self-inflating bag and reservoir is good. Although the bag mask apparatus enables ventilation with high concentrations of oxygen, its use by a single person requires considerable skill. When used with a face mask, it is often difficult to achieve a gas-tight seal between the mask and the patient's face and maintain a patent airway with one hand while squeezing the bag with the other. Any significant leak will cause hypoventilation and if the airway is not patent, gas may be forced into the stomach. The two-person technique for bag mask ventilation is preferable. The two-person technique for bag mask ventilation is preferable one person holds the face mask in place using a jaw thrust with both hands and an assistant squeezes the bag. In this way a better seal can be achieved. A volume of 400 to 600 mils is required to adequately ventilate a patient per breath. This is around one third of the self-inflating bag based on a one and a half to two litre bag size. The bag should be squeezed slowly to avoid generating high airway pressures. Squeezing the bag quickly and forcefully is a natural tendency if the mask is not sealing effectively due to using a one-handed technique. The effective use of bag mask ventilation requires skill, with inexperienced practitioners likely to achieve ineffective tidal volumes and cause gastric inflation. Supraglottic airway devices are easier to insert than a tracheal tube and unlike a tracheal tube they can generally be positioned without interrupting chest compressions. The laryngeal mask airway is a reliable and safe device that can be introduced easily with a high degree of success after a short period of training. The LMA is a long wide bore tube with an elliptical inflatable cuff at the end designed to seal around the laryngeal opening. Ventilation using a laryngeal mask airway and a self-inflating bag is more efficient and easier than with the bag mask valve alone, provided that high inflation pressures are avoided. Although not guaranteeing protection of the airway from gastric contents, pulmonary aspiration during the use of LMAs is uncommon. When an LMA can be inserted without delay, it is preferable to avoid bag mass ventilation altogether as the risk of gastric inflation and regurgitation is reduced. The insertion of a laryngeal mask airway requires the patient to be deeply unconscious to avoid coughing and stimulation of the gag reflex. The use of an LMA is particularly valuable if attempted intubation by skilled personnel has failed and bag mass ventilation is impossible. If the insertion of an LMA is required during a cardiopulmonary arrest, if possible, maintain chest compressions throughout the insertion attempt. If it is necessary to stop chest compressions, limit the pause to 10 seconds. Select an appropriately sized LMA. Generally, a size 5 will fit most men and a size 4 will fit most women. If unsure, Usually on the side of the LMA is guidance on who that particular LMA is appropriate for and the volume of air required to inflate the cuff. Deflate the cuff, then lubricate the outer face of the cuff area with water-soluble gel. Flex the patient's neck slightly and extend the head. Try to maintain neutral alignment of the head and neck if there is a suspicion of cervical spine injury. Holding the LMA like a pen, insert it into the mouth. 
Advance the tip behind the upper surface of the incisors with the upper surface applied to the palate until it reaches the posterior pharyngeal wall. Press the mask backwards and downwards around the corner of the pharynx until resistance is felt as it locates the back of the pharynx. If possible, get an assistance to apply a jaw thrust after the LMA has been inserted. This increases the space of the posterior pharynx, making placement easier. A slight 45 degree twist will also aid in placement. Connect the inflating syringe. Usually, 25 mils of air is required for a size 3, 30 mils for a size 4, and 40 mils for a size 5 LMA. If the LMA has not been inserted successfully, reoxygenate the patient before reattempting, if possible. A clear airway should be confirmed by visual assessment of bilateral chest movement and auscultation of breath sounds. It is reasonable to insert a bite block alongside the LMA tube, if available, and secure the LMA with a bandage or tape. Some limitations of using an LMA are In the presence of high airway resistance or poor lung compliance, there is a risk of significant leak around the cough, causing hypoventilation. There is no data demonstrating whether or not it is possible to provide adequate ventilation via an LMA without interruption of chest compressions. There is also a theoretical risk of aspiration of stomach contents because the LMA does not sit within the larynx like a tracheal tube. If the patient is not deeply unconscious, insertion of the LMA may cause coughing, straining, or laryngeal spasm. This will not occur in patients in cardiac arrest. Uncommonly, airway obstruction may be caused by the epiglottis folding down to cover the laryngeal inlet. Other types of LMA exist, such as the modified LMA, the eye gel airway, and the laryngeal tube. Refer to your local policies and education programs regarding these devices. In an arrest situation, there is insufficient evidence to support or refute the use of any specific technique to maintain an airway and provide ventilation in adults with cardiopulmonary arrest. Despite this, tracheal intubation is perceived as the optimal method of providing and maintaining a clear and secure airway. A systematic review of randomized controlled trials of tracheal intubation versus alternative airway management in acutely ill and injured patients has, has identified just three trials. Two of these were random controlled trials of the Comba tube versus tracheal intubation for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, which showed no difference in survival. The third study was a random controlled trial of pre-hospital tracheal intubation versus management of the airway with bag, mask in children requiring airway management for cardiac arrest, primary respiratory disorders and severe injuries. There was no overall benefit for tracheal intubation with those randomised to intubation having lower survival rates. It should only be used when trained personnel are available to carry out the procedure with a high level of skill and competence. The perceived advantages of tracheal intubation over bag mask ventilation include maintenance of a patent airway which provides protection from aspiration of gastric contents and the ability to deliver adequate tidal volumes readily even during chest compressions allowing compressions to continue uninterrupted. Perceived disadvantages of tracheal intubation over bag mass ventilation include the risk of unrecognized misplaced tracheal tube placement, which is as high as 17% in some studies examining out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and prolonged time without ch chest compressions while tracheal intubation is being attempted. Tracheal intubation success rates correlate with the intubation experience attained by the rescuer. Rescuers should weigh the risks and benefits of tracheal intubation against the need to provide effective chest compressions. The intubation attempt will require some interruption to chest compressions, 
but once in place, ventilation will not require further interruptions to chest compressions. No tracheal intubation attempt during resuscitation should interrupt compressions for more than 10 seconds. Alternatively, to avoid interrupting chest compressions, the intubation attempt may be deferred until after the return of spontaneous circulation. After tracheal intubation, tube placement must be confirmed and the tube secured adequately. If there is any doubt about the correct position of the tube, remove it and reoxygenate the patient. Equipment required for tracheal intubation includes a laryngoscope, generally a curved Macintosh blade. The blades come in a variety of sizes as shown here. You should check the light source and battery before use and ensure that spares are immediately available. A selection of cuff tracheal tubes should be available. The size of the tube refers to its internal diameter in millimetres. An 8mm diameter tube is suitable for most adult males and a 7mm diameter tube is suitable for a female. Generally, a size 6, 7 and 8mm tube will cover the immediate needs of most adults. Some extras that may be utilised during an intubation include lubricating jelly, McGill's forceps to guide the tube, introducers such as a gum elastic bougie or a semi-rigid stylet, tape or bandage to secure the tube position, and suction equipment that can be used to clear the mouth if required. After successful intubation, connect the tracheal tube to a ventilating device and ventilate using the highest concentration of oxygen available. Inflate the cuff of the tracheal tube as recommended by your local policy. The correct placement of the tracheal tube should be assessed using clinical assessment and a technique for secondary confirmation. The use of CO2 detection is considered the most reliable secondary technique for confirming tracheal intubation. Once confirmed, the endotracheal tube should be secured with a bandage or tie. Adhesive tape is not reliable at securing endotracheal tubes, especially if the patient's face is moist. Unrecognized esophageal intubation is the most serious complication of attempted tracheal intubation. Routine use of primary and secondary techniques to confirm correct placement of the tracheal tube will reduce this risk. Primary clinical assessment signs include the rise and fall of the chest, condensation in the tube, chest sounds on auscultation that are equal and adequate. Also, by auscultating over the stomach, you should not be able to hear air entry. There are many potential problems that can occur during tracheal intubation. Anatomical and pathological variations can make intubation difficult. If the vocal cords cannot be seen, do not make any attempts to insert the endotracheal tube blindly. Waveform capnography is the most sensitive and specific way to confirm and continuously monitor the position of a tracheal tube in victims of cardiac arrest and should supplement the clinical assessment of auscultation and visualization of the tube through the cords. Waveform capnography will not discriminate between tracheal and bronchial placement of the tube, making careful auscultation essential. Disposable colorimetric end-tidal carbon dioxide detectors use a litmus paper to detect CO2. Although colorimetric detectors identify placement quite well in patients with good perfusion, these devices are less accurate than clinical assessment in cardiac arrest patients because pulmonary blood flow may be so low that there is insufficient exhaled CO2. The use of cricoid pressure in non-arrest patients may offer some measure of protection to the airway from aspiration. However, the role of cricoid pressure during cardiac arrest has not been studied. In studies on anaesthetized patients, cricoid pressure during routine bag mask ventilation 
has been shown to impair ventilation in many patients by increasing airway pressures while causing complete obstruction in up to 50% of cases in some studies in the range of recommended effective pressure to use. If cricoid pressure is used during a cardiac arrest, adjust, relax or release the pressure if it impedes ventilation or tracheal tube placement. The routine use of cricoid pressure during cardiac arrest is not recommended by the Australian and New Zealand Resuscitation Council guidelines. This brings to a close this brief tutorial on advanced life support, airway, following the Australian and New Zealand Resuscitation Council guidelines released at the end of December 2010.